Well, welcome back to our course on computer organization and architecture. Now we're going to be getting into the second part of this initial section, as you might recall, where we had the basic concepts in computer evolution in the last lecture, and now we're going to be talking about um, performance. And so here is just a, um, a table of contents, if you will, of the, the basic things that we're going to be covering. Um, so ultimately, we're going to be looking at how we look at designing for performance. We'll get a chance to be looking at the development of, of this over time. What are the various types of metrics that are out there? And what are the basic measures of computer performance that we want to be using, whether it be clock speed or instruction execution rate? And what are the pros and cons of each one of those? We'll then be talking about other types of factors that are important for us to be thinking about, um, the different types of mean to come up with an, a sense of an average type of performance. We'll be looking at a variety of different type of benchmarking principles um, and, and also the, the specs benchmarking as well. So um, year by year, the cost of um, computer systems continue to drop dramatically while the performance and capac capacity of those systems continue to rise equally dramatically. Today's laptops have the computing powers of an IBM mainframe from 10 to 15 years ago. So that's the things that we're seeing is that um, what we have really available on our desktop or laptop or even our tablet as it's starting to catch up on that regard as well as getting phenomenal. Thus, we have virtual, quote, free computer power. Processors are also inexpensive that we now have microprocessors we can throw away. The digital pregnancy test is an example. This is used once and then thrown away and, and the continuing technological revolution that enables the development of applications of astounding complexity and power. For example, desktop applications that require the, the great power of today's microprocessor-based systems include image processing, three-dimensional rendering, speech recognition, video conferencing, multimedia authoring, voice and video annotation of files, and simultaneous modeling. All that is out there. Workstation systems now support high, highly sophisticated engineering and scientific applications and have the capacity to support image and video applications. In addition, businesses are relying on increasing powerful servers to handle transaction and database processing and to support massive client server networks that have replaced the huge mainframe computer centers of yesterday. As well, cloud services provide um, Providers use massive high-performing banks of servers to satisfy high volume, high transaction rate application for a broad spectrum of clients. What a fascinating about all this is that from the perspective of computer organization and architecture is on one hand, the basic building blocks for today's computing um, miracles are virtually the same as those of the IAS computer from 50 years ago. We talked about that in the last lecture. The techniques for squeezing the, the maximum performance out of the materials at hand have become increasingly sophisticated. This observe, observation serves as a guiding principle for what we're going to be covering in this course and is also what's in the textbook as we progress through the various elements and, and components of a computer, two objects are per pursued. First, the book and the course explains the fundamental functionality in each area under consideration. And second, the book and the course explores those techniques required to achieve maximum performance. And so that's um, a nice little perspective on what we have here. So um, let's think about microprocessor speed. What gives the Intel x86 processor or IBM mainframe computer such mind-boggling power is the relentless pursuit of speed by processor chips manufacturers. And all the time, but typically is looked at um, up to recently is just be looking at the clock speed as the fundamental way of uh, assessing how well the performance of uh, computational capability is. The evolution of this machines continues to bear out Moore's law. And we'll be talking about that as we go. Actually, we're now getting into a place where it's a post Moore's law environment. And we talked about Moore's law 
um, in an introductory fashion in the last lecture. So long as this law holds, chip makers can unleash a new generation of chips every three years with four times as many transistors. And for a, a quite an, a long period of time, that was exactly what we saw. Memory chips, this says quadruple the capacity of dynamic random access memory or DRAM. Um, still the, the basic technology for computer main memory um, every three years and microprocessors, the addition of new circuits and the speed boost that comes from reducing the distance between them has improved performance four or five fold every three years or so since Intel launched its x86 family in 1978. But the raw speed of the microprocessor will not achieve the, its potential unless it's fed a constant stream of work to do in the form of computer instructions. Anything that gets in the way of that smooth flow undermines the power of the processor. Accordingly, while the chip makers have been busy leaning, learning how to fabricate chips of greater and greater density, the processor design must come up with even more elaborate techniques for feeding, quote, the monster. Among the techniques um, built are the contemporary processors are the following. This is what we have in this chart. First, pipelining, the execution of instructions involves multiple stages of operation, including fetching the instruction, decoding the opcode, fetching the operands, performing a calculation, and so on. Pipeline enables a processor to work simultaneously on multiple instructions by performing a different phase for each of the multiple instructions at the same time. The processor overlaps operations by moving data or instructions into a conceptual pipeline with the stages of the pipeline process simultaneously. So that's the first thing we have. What about branch prediction? The processor looks ahead at the instruction code fetched from memory and predicts which branches or groups of instructions are likely to be processed next. If the processor gets right, most of the time it can prefetch the content, and that's a term that we'll be thinking about more, prefetch the, con the correct instruction and buffer them so that the processor is kept busy. The more sophisticated examples of the, of the strategy predict not just the next branch, but multiple branches ahead. Thus, the branch prediction increases the amount of work available for the processor to execute. Third, we have um, superscalar execution. This is the ability to issue more than one instruction in every processor clock cycle. In effect, multiple parallel pipelines are, are used. Another example fourth is the data flow analysis. The processor analyzes which instructions are dependent on each other or data to create an optimized schedule of instructions. In fact, instructions are scheduled to be executed when ready, dependent of the original program order. This prevents unnecessary de delay. And Fifth and finally, we have speculative execution using branch prediction and data flow analysis. Some processors speculatively execute instructions ahead of their actual appearance in the program execution, holding the result in temporary location. This enables a processor to keep its execution engine as busy as possible by executing instructions that are likely to be needed. So this is a couple of things to be thinking about in terms of processor speed and the capability that we're trying to maximize as much as possible. While processor power has raced ahead of, of breakneck speed, other critical components of the computer must not um, um, keep, um, other critical components of the computer have not kept up. The result is a need to look for performance balance um, an adjustment of the organization or architecture to compensate for the mismatch among the capabilities of the various components. So if you have one component that's working really well and other components aren't, that's going to be a huge problem. And so this is the way that we need to be figure out how to offset that. The problem created by such a mismatch is particularly critical at the, the interface between the processor and main memory, where our processor speed has grown rapidly. The speed with which data can be transferred between main memory and the processor has lagged badly. The interface between the processor and the main memory is the most critical pathway in the entire computer because it was responsible for carrying a constant flow of program instructions and data between memory checks, chips and the processor. If memory or the pathway fails to keep 
pace with the processor's intended demands, a processor stalls in, in a wait state and valuable processing time is lost. A system architecture can attack this problem in a number of ways, all of which are reflected in contemporary computer design. Consider the following example. We can be increasing the number of bits that are retrieved at one time by making DRAMs wider rather than deeper and by using wide bus data paths. And so this has been an example of things going from 16 to 32 to 64 bits so far and going further beyond that in the future, say to 128 bits. Change the DRAM interface to make it more efficient by including cache or other buffering schemes on the, the DRAM chip. And so this is something we're gonna be talking about um, how amazingly just by having cache, we can improve the overall performance. And so that definitely is something that has been found to be useful. Reduce the frequency of memory access by incorporating increasing complex and efficient caching, st caching structures between the processor and main memory. This includes the incorporation of one or more caches on the processor chip, as well as an off-chip cache close to the processor chip. Um, another thing is increase the, the interconnect bandwidth between processors and memory by using higher speed buses and a hierarchy of buses to buffer and structure data flow. So let's get an idea of the different type of data rates with the, the commonly used things that we are, have in a computer environment going all the way from ethernets all the way down to the keyboard. And so now we're getting a chance to be thinking about the input and output, the input and output devices that we need to be working with. So in this figure, um, seeing what is in figure 2.1 of the, the textbook, it gives some examples. And I probably don't need to dwell on this in, in too much detail, but you can look through this and um, we can see a couple observation. Um, we, the ethernet is the, the fastest thing that we have out here. The Wi-Fi technologies are trying to make this um, be as fast. And so um, at times it can be on par with one another. Now we're getting into optical fiber. And so this is pushing this, this maximum data rate that's uh, available to an even higher level than what we have now. Well, what about improvements in chip organization and architecture as designers wrestle with the challenges of balancing processor performance with that of main memory and other computer components, the need to increase processor speed remains. There are three approaches to achieving increased processor speed. And that's what we have laid out here. First, increasing the hardware speed of the processor. We've already talked about that. This increase is fundamentally due to shrinking the size of the logic gates of the processor chips so that more gates can be packed together tightly and to increase the clock rate. With gates closer together, the propagation time for signals is significantly reduced, enabling a speed up of the processor. An increase in clock rate means the individual operations are executed more rapidly. So that's number one. Number two, we can increase the size and speed of the caches that are inter um, pose between the processor and main memories. Um, last chapter, last lecture, we talked about three different types of caches that are used in processors. Um, you can have other areas where we can be introducing cache, caches, not just inside the processor. So by increasing the speed and size of the caches, they are interposed between the processor and the main memory. We can see that um, the, that by, by dedicating a portion of the processor chip itself to the cache, cache access times drop significantly. And then finally, we can make changes to the process organization and architecture that increase the, the effective speed of instrument execution. Typically, this involves using parallels in one form or another. And that's something that we'll be talking about in the course as we progress. So what about the problem with clock speed and logic density? So we can be thinking of a couple of things here. Um, traditionally, the dominant factor in performance gains has been increasing the clock speed to, to clock density. However, as clock speed and logic density increase, a number of obstacles show up. So first of all, power is the density of logic and the, the speed clock speed on the chip increases. So does the power density. And so it's difficult to dissipate all that heat. Uh, on high-density, high-speed chips because of a, a serious um, 
um, design challenges that have to be dealt with. So that's number one. Number two, what about RC delay? The speed at which electrons can flow on a chip between transistors is limited to the resistance and capacity, R for resistance, C for capacitance of the metal wires connecting them. Specifically, the delay increases as the RC products increases as the components on the chips decrease in size, the wire connects become thinner, increasing resistance. Also, the wires are closer together, increasing capacitance. So that's the second area. The third is memory latency and throughput. Memory access speed, that is latency and transfer speed, which is throughput, lag processor speeds as previously discussed. Thus, there will be more emphasis on organization or architectural approaches to improve performance. These techniques are discussed um, later in the course in the later chapters of the textbook. And so here is a figure just to give you an idea of the different types of processor trends um, showing how the, the number of transistors are increasing, the, the frequency of the processor is increasing, the, the amount of power and the number of cores. It, just the numbers of cores is relatively speaking a new addition for these trends. And so we can see a lot of these things are continuing to go up we're seeing some flattening out of the, the frequency, the clock frequency, um, the, and, and that has been the result of trying to have another compensation factor is by having the number of cores increasing. So you can read through the chapter to get some more insights there, but we'll continue on and let's think about multi-cores. With all the difficulties excited in the preceding section in mind, um, designers have turned to fundamentally new approaches to improving performance, that is placing multiple processors on the same chip. And so that's what I was just trying to point out here in this part of this graph on the previous slide. Um, with a large shared cache, the use of multiple processors on the same chip, also referred to multi, multiple cores or multi-core, provides the potential to increase performance without increasing the clock rate. Studies indicate that Within a processor, the increase in performance is roughly proportional to the square root of the increase in complexity. But if the software can support the effective use of multi-core processors, then doubling the number of processors almost doubles performance. Thus, the strategy is to use two simpler processors on a chip rather than one more complex processor. And another thing that we saw on the chip that there is also now that the, the power um, and thus the amount of heat that needs to be dealt with is starting to flatten out. Studies indicate that within a process, the increase in performance is roughly proportional to the square root of the increase in complexity. I already mentioned that. Um, so um, in addition with two processors, larger caches are justified. So that's something that's also being thinked about. And as the logic density on chips continues to rise, the trend is to, to both more cores and more cache on a single chip. And so we're gonna see those trends starting to continue to progress. Okay, well, let's think about a couple other things um, in the initial slide, trying to show what we're gonna cover. We talked about mix and that's many integrated core and also GPUs, graphic processor units. And so we, here we have a little bit of summary of those. So chip manufacturers are now in the process of making a huge leap forward in the number of cores per chip with the number of that more with more than 50 cores per chip is being the, the, the number that at the time of the publishing of the text was, was a number that was seeming to be where we were at. So the leap in performance as well as the challenges in developing software to exploit such large number of cores. And so this is where we start to be thinking about dealing with mix or multiple integrated cores that we're using. So the way that we're gonna be writing our software or translating that software to how it's going to be um, executed by the hardware is the thing that needs to be th thought about. So the multi-core and mix strategy involves a homogeneous collection of general purpose processors on a single chip. At the same time, chip manufacturers are pursuing another option, a chip with multiple ge generic um, general purpose processors um, plus graphic 
processing units or GPUs and specialized cores for video processing other tasks. And so here we can be having a dedicated processor that is really ideal for some very computationally intense things and you can be offloading it in that. So a GPU is a core designed to perform parallel operations on graphical data. Traditionally found on a plug-in graphic card, it is used to encode and render 2D and 3D graphics as well as process video. So those are some things for us to be thinking about. Okay, just for, for some definition, and we're starting to get into how we think about performance. So first of all, we'll be talking about Amdahl's law. Computer systems designers look for ways to improve system performance by advances in technology or changes in design. Examples include the use of parallel processors, the use of memory cache hierarchy, and speeding up the memory access time and IO transfer rates due to technology improvements. In all of these cases, it's important to note that a speed up in one aspect of the technology or design does not result in a computing performance, um, com corresponding improvement in performance. This limitation is succinctly expressed by Amdahl's law. And in the next slide, we'll see a picture of that. So, um, so graphically, so Amdahl's law was first proposed by Gene Amdahl in 1967 and deals with the potential speed up of pro programs using multiple processors compared to a single processor. Nevertheless, Amdahl's law illustrates a problem facing the industry in developing a multi-core machines with an ever-growing number of cores. The software that runs on such machine machines must be adapted to a highly parallel execution environment to exploit the power of parallel processors. Amdahl's law can be generalized to evaluate any design or technical improvement in a computer system. So that's the reason why it's um, important. So, this is just an illustration of Amdahl's law. So um, consider a program running on a single processor such as that a fraction one minus F. So the execution time involves coding that it inherently is in inherently serial and a fraction F that involves code that is in infinitely parallelizable with no scheduling overhead. Let T be the total execution time of the program using a single processor. Then the speed up using a parallel processor with N processors that fully exploit the parallel portion of the program is as follows. The speed up equals to the time to execute a program on a single processor um, over the, the time to execute a program on N parallel processors. So you can be looking at that in more detail in the, the textbook, but just trying to give you some intuitive sense of an explanation of that. So here we see some graphs of the, the numbers and the impact of what can happen. So conclusions can be drawn first when F is small, the number of parallel processors has limited effect. Um, as N approaches infinity, speed up is bound by one over one minus F, so there are diminishing returns for using multiple multiple processors. And so we see we get to a point where there's this flattening out that starts to occur. So that's the first law that we'll think about. Here's another one, and this is called Little's Law. So a fundamental and simple relationship with broad application is Little's Law. We can apply it to almost any system that is statistically in steady state and in which there's no leakage. Using queuing theory terminology, Little's law applies to a queuing system. The central element of the system is a server, which provides some service to items. Um, items from several po populations of items arrive at the system to be served. If the, the server is idle, an item is observed immediately. Otherwise, an arriving item joins a wait line or queue there can be a single queue or a single server, a single queue for multiple servers or multiple queues, uh, one for each of uh, multiple servers. When a server has completed serving an item, the, the, the item departs. If there are items waiting in the queue, one is immediately dispatched to the server. The server in this model can represent anything that performs 
some fundamental, some function or service for a collection of items. So that's just a little bit of an explanation of that. You can read the, the textbook for, for more details. Well, let's now let's think about the system clock. Um, oper operations performed by a processor such as fetching or instruction, um, decoding the instruction, performing a ret arithmetic app operation or so on are governed by the clock speed, um, the, the system clock. Typically, uh, all operations begin with the, the pulse of the, the clock. This at its most fundamental level, the speed of the processor is dictated by the pulse frequency produced by the clock measured in cycles per second or hertz. So this is what we're seeing here. We have the quartz crystal goes to an ADD conver converter, and this is the, the, the um, square wave that we're used for the, the system clock that keeps everything synchronized. Well, let's talk about the performance factors and system attributes. And so this table shows a matrix in which one dimension shows the five performance factors and the other dimension shows the four system attributes. An X in a cell indicates a system attribute that affects a performance factor. And so we can see that there is these, these various things that are are laid out here. A common measure of performance for a processor is the rate at which instructions are executed, expressed as millions of instructions per second or MIPS. So, and so we can be thinking of a MIPS rate. Another common performance measure deals only with the floating point instructions. These are com common in many scientific and gaming applications. Floating point performance is expressed in millions of floating point operations per second, or flops. And so those are stuff that we would be thinking about. All right, well, let's now talk about the calculating the mean, and we'll have a couple different um, things that we can be thinking of. We can be thinking of an arithmetic, a geometric, or a harmonic mean. In evaluating some aspects of computer system performance, it is often the case that a single number such as execution time or memory consumes is used to characterize performance and compare system. Clearly, a single number can provide only very simplified view of system capability. Nevertheless, and especially in the field of benchmarking, single numbers are typically used to for performance comparisons. So you can be looking at section 2.6 in the textbook to, to read more about that. And so the, the use of benchmarks to compare systems involves calculating the mean of a set of data points relative to execution time. And so the three common formulas used for calculating mean are arithmetic, geometric, and harmonic. So here, um, we have a, an illustration in figure 2.6 of the text, the, the three means applied to various data sets. And so we, we can be seeing them compared one to another um, to give us some perspective. And so, um, so each, the, this chart, this figure illustrates the three mean applied to various data sets each of which has 11 data points and a maximum data point value of 11. The median value is also included in the chart. So that's the reason why we're seeing four for each one of these. Um, perhaps what stands out the most is the fact that the HM, um, so HM is a harmonic mean, has a tendency to produce a misleading result when the data is skewed to larger values or when the there is a, a small value um, outlier. So MD is a mean, AM is arithmetic mean, GM is a geometric mean, and HM is a harmonic mean. And we can see those labeled here for each of those cases. The arithmetic mean is an appropriate measure if the sum of all the measurements is a meaningful and interesting value. The arithmetic mean is a good candidate for comparing the execution time performance of several systems. And so here we just have some more details of that. You can um, feel free to, to look over this chart in, in more detail. I'm just gonna continue on here, just trying to give you a general sense of these um, means and what we do with them. 
So here we have a comparison of the arithmetic and harmonic means for, for rates. Um, so this is this table um, compares the performance of three computers on the execution of two programs. And so we are looking at for simplicity, we will assume that the each execution of each program results in an execution of 10 to the eight floating point operations. The left hand of the table shows the execution time for each computing, computer running each program, the total execution time, and the arithmetic mean for executing the, the time. The right half of the table provides comparison in terms of rates expressed in megaflops, mflops. Uh, the rate calculation is straightforward. Um, and so we can just be seeing uh, each one of those three computing environments compared to, to one another for those two um, areas. Now we can be thinking of a comparison for arithmetic and ge geometric means for normalized results. And so we're thinking about for three different kinds of computing environments. Um, so we use the, the same performance results as we were in tables 2.2. Um, in table 2.3a, all results are normalized to computer A, and then the mean are calculated in the normalized values based on total execution time A is faster than B, which is faster than C. Both the arith mean, arithmetic mean and the geometric mean of the normalized times are reflect this. Tables 2.3b, the systems are now normalized to B. Again, the geometric means correctly reflect the relative speed of the three computers, but now the arithmetic mean produces a different ordering. So we can just see the, the pros and cons of all of, all of these different means. So um, now in table 2.4, um, we're just looking at some, some more details here um, for the, the normalized results. And I'm just gonna go ahead and skip over that. You can feel free to take um, a peek at that or pause the, the video. So now let's talk about benchmarking principles. The It's a desirable characteristics of a benchmark program. It is written in a high level language, making it portable across different machines. It is representative of a particular kind of programming domain or paradigm such as system programming, numerical programming, or commercial programming can be measured easily and it has wide distribution. So this is where you would want to be seeing these kind of characteristics if you wanted to make sure that a benchmark is going to be used. Now here's an example of a, a benchmark, a System Performance Evaluation Corporation or SPEC. So, um, the best known such collection of benchmarking suites is defined and maintained by the System Performance and Evaluation Corporation and interest in industry consortium. Spec performance measures are widely used in, uh, for comparison and research purposes. And so this is why we wanted to make sure that we spend a little bit of time of introducing that. Here is a spec for um, one of those benchmarks and the best known of the spec benchmark suites is this CPU 2017. This is the industry standard suite for processor intensive application to the time of the writing of the text and um, the information that we're using for the content of this course. So there are other standards out there include um, the spec cloud would be one, the spec viewpoint, um, view performance, um, um, spec, Spec WPC, Spec CJVM 2008, um, and et cetera, 2015, 2014, um, all kinds of different ones, but I'm not going to get into those. You can refer to the textbook for a chance to be thinking about that. So the next four charts, I'm not gonna be spending too much time on. You can feel free to look these over in more details at a later time in the textbook, but um, you can get a chance to see this. And so first of all, this is a spec CPU 2017. And so this is the, the different types of things that are laid out there for, for that. Um, this is some, some more details. This is for integer benchmarking. Um, 
This is for um, integer benchmarking for high performance in integrity Superdome X. So this is another area where the CPU 2017 can be used. And finally, this is another one, the integer ben benchmarking for the high performance integrity Superdome X. So once again, I refer you to the textbook so, so for more details. So what are some of the terms that are used in the spec documentation? Here are those things here, the, the benchmark, a program written in high level language that can be compiled and executed on any computer that implements the compiler. System under test is the, the system to be evaluated, the reference machine. This is the system used by spec to establish a baseline performance for all benchmarks. So we, we have that. We have the the, um, the 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 P the base metric. These are required for reported results and have strict guidelines for for compilation. We have peak metrics. This enables user to, to attempt to optimize system performance, optimizing the computer output. We have speed metrics. This is simply a measurement of the time it takes to execute a, a compiled benchmark. And finally, we have the rate metric. This is a measurement of how many tasks a computer can accomplish in a certain amount of time. Okay, here is a illustration for the spec uh, evaluation flow chart. And so you can see how this um, flows along here. And so there is a looping process that is allowed. Um, so you can feel free to pause that and look over that in, in more detail. So the um, spec CPU 27 introduces an additional experimental metrics that enables measurement of power consumption while running the benchmark, giving users insight into the relationship between performance and power. And so this is what this table is trying to show. Um, I'm not gonna to dwell on this in detail, it's also just trying to give you some more insight into the spec, spec benchmarking and the capabilities that are available. All right, well, let's just finish up with this last slide. We show this in the beginning. Now you should have a lot better sense of what we were proposing in this initial um, slide. We talked about design performance. The microprocessor is not the only thing that needs to be thought of in terms of making a computational capability to perform better. Um, Multi-cores is um, an area where it has gotten a lot of um, um, traction with um, the latest ways of improving performance. We talk, talked about mix and um, GPUs. We talked about a couple of different laws that or have been around for a while to give us a baseline of performance. And typically the, the way that we look at how to compare performance is either in clock speed or instructions per second. Although those are things that are still used, um, we also saw some examples of how we can be comparing different types of means to compare um, performance for, for different types of computing systems. And then we got into benchmarking First of all, talking about benchmarking principles and then getting into spec benchmarking specifically and then looked in, in detail at CPU 2017, the, the most commonly used um, spec benchmarking. All right, well, thank you very much.